I love God's Word, and uh, God's Word changes lives. It's not Will Graham, it's not Billy Graham, it's not Franklin Graham. It's God's Word, the Bible. That's what can change lives. That's what speaks into our heart. Christ comes into us and makes us a whole new creation. That's a miracle, and I get to see that so often just because I'm on the front row, literally on the stage, and I'm watching everybody down there give their life to Christ. That's a miracle, and I'll never get tired of that. Welcome to the Jesus Calling Podcast. Today's guests have been blessed with rich family legacies and honor the values and lessons they've been taught from previous generations. Author and pastor Will Graham and writer and decorator Mike Willen Smith. First up, Will Graham is the grandson of the legendary minister Billy Graham and the vice president of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. Although he grew up under the legacy of his grandfather, Will was given freedom to follow any path he chose. Will shares what it was like growing up in the Graham family, about the winding path he followed as God led him to serve in his family's ministry, and some stories from his first book, Redeemed, Devotions for the Longing Soul. My name is uh, Will Graham, and uh, I'm the oldest son of Jane and Franklin Graham, which means my grandfather's Dr. Billy Graham. I guess one of the most interesting things is, is that uh, my grandfather and I, we have the exact same name. He's William Franklin Graham Jr. My father's William Franklin Graham III. I'm William Franklin Graham IV. My son's actually William Franklin Graham V. But, uh, and we call him Quinn. Quinn means five. So if you're tired of our name, I'm sorry. Just uh, That's what's happened. There's been five generations of us. So it's a, it's, now it's my son's problem. If he wants to pass on the name, that's his deal. If not, that's, it's up to him. I've done my part. I passed the name on. I've had my son, gave him the name, and uh, he's a good boy. I grew up in the mountains of Western North Carolina, a community called Boone, which was home of Appalachian State University. Um, matter of fact, that's what actually brought my family to Boone, was that my father had to go back to school, or at least finish school. And so he got kicked out of multiple schools, never did well. And uh, after he got married and, and I was born, he decided, you know what, I better get serious about this. You know, I got a family dependent on me. And so his parents said, well, we'll still pay for college if you go. So he wanted to make sure that he still had mom and dad paying for that bill because he couldn't afford it as a you know, new parent. We grew up on a farm. Uh, we didn't have any cows. Uh, we had a few horses. We had a pot belly pig. We had roosters. We had a pet raccoon, cats, gerbils, hamsters. I mean, we even had a parrot. We had acreage, so we rode motorcycles everywhere we went. Um, we loved to ride motorcycles. That's one thing I always wanted to be was a professional motorcycle racer. Um, I love riding. So as soon as I got home from school, I would ride and ride and ride until I ran out of gas or my, I'd take flashlights to my motorcycle so I could keep going. Went to a public high school. Um, you know, no one treated me any different. Uh, they, no one my age really cared who your granddaddy was. Uh, they, they cared more if you had the latest Nintendo game. Back then it was Nintendo. Um, you know, or the, you know, what you could do in sports. So that, they're more worried about, you know, could I score a goal in soccer or could I help the team win more than anything else? They didn't really care about who my granddaddy was. And I pretty much lived in the mountains my whole life, uh, except for a small stint when I went to Liberty University. And then uh, I went down to Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary down in Wake Forest, North Carolina. For, so that education time was about the only time out of the mountains. And in 2006, I left my local church in, uh, in Raleigh and they came and helped uh, my dad. And my dad said, I want you in Asheville, North Carolina. And so, which was great because all my grandparents at this time were still alive. Um, I was 31, still had four living grandparents. Uh, so I got to spend the last, uh, the last few years of my grandparents' life, I got to spend time with them there in Montreat, uh, North Carolina. Uh, right down the, from the road where I live. So we grew up in a, in a Christian home. My mom and dad had just become Christians. They were, they were in a sense, baby Christians um, right before I, um, they got married. And so their, you know, their Christian faith was still developing. Now, now they knew a lot about the Bible. They knew a lot about God, but personally, they never allowed God to transform their lives. They believed in God. They trusted in God. They started instilling God's word into us. We, even at a young age, we started memorizing Scripture. We were having Bible studies at night, you know, uh, reading the Bible together, and um, very, very appreciative of that. And I'm so thankful that my dad 
and told me about Christ. And I think it's real important as parents that we, one of the greatest things that we can ever do is tell our children about Christ. Don't, don't expect a Sunday school teacher. Uh, don't expect, you know, uh, a friend or a pastor to do it. I expect you need to do it. Lead your child to Christ. People often ask me, so Will, when did you decide to get into the family business? You know, when were you going to fall into your granddaddy and your dad's steps? I think one of my first memories I had was a uh, teacher said, draw a picture of what you want to be. All the guys drew like Joe Montana football helmets, you know, or Dan Marino helmets. But for me, I drew a picture of um, an, an open Bible and a pair of David Clark headsets. These are what aviators use. And so they would, they're like earmuffs with a microphone on them. And I drew that because I wanted to fly around and tell people about Jesus. Basically, I want to be like my dad. My dad was a pilot. That's why I saw those David Clark headsets were on his head. Then later on, I went to Liberty University and I think God was preparing me uh, for ministry there. I knew that God had called me to ministry. I still didn't know what. God still hadn't revealed you know, what I was supposed to be doing. So I said, well, I'll get some more education. Went to seminary at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary and right outside of Raleigh, North Carolina. And it was during that time uh, that God led me uh, to talk to a pastor. And he said, Will, he said, uh, the BGA, the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, the BGA, you guys always work through local churches. I said, we always work through local churches. It's, we believe in the local church. We're, we're not the local church, but we want to assist the local church in evangelizing people. He does Samaritan's Purse work through local churches. I said, absolutely, Samaritan's Purse only works through local churches. So when we're handing out all those shoe boxes, Operation Christmas Child, they're always done through the local church. So um, he said, well, Will, shouldn't you know how a local church works then if you can go work at Samaritan's Purse or the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association? I said, hmm, you know, you got a point there. He said, let's do an internship. Let's uh, get an internship. You'll work six months. If you like it and we like it, I mean, it's, we'll do it for another six months. And I really didn't want to. But I was like, you know what, this makes sense. I started working at this church for six months and about eight years later, <laughs> I was still there. And now they had me pastoring a, a church plant. And so I became a pastor in those eight years. And uh, I really loved it. And God changed my heart in it. I had one of, the, one, of, one of the greatest opportunities to play my grandfather, An Unbroken Path to Redemption, which is the second half story of Louis Zamperini, uh, which is one of the incre most incredible people I've ever read about in my life. I never got to meet him personally. Um, he died before I got to meet him. But man, what a story. It's an incredible book written by Laura Hildenbrandt. And I had it on uh, my iPad as, a, as like a Kindle book on my iPad. And so, because when I travel, that's, it's hard to take books with you. So I remember reading this. I think I was on my way to India at the time, and I was just reading this book. And I was so fascinated with this book. I couldn't believe it. I mean, this is an incredible story. And um, I, just, I, mean, I just kept reading it. I didn't watch any of the movies on the plane. I just kept reading this book. I mean, I was captivated by it. And, it, and I knew that he would come to know Christ because I heard about his stories many times from my grandparents. Then when the movie came out, uh, the first movie, Unbroken, and a lot of Christians, including our own family, you know, they said, you know, they didn't tell the whole story because they, the, they end the first movie with Louis coming home and hugging his mom and dad, which is true. I mean, that's, and the whole movie was good, except they didn't finish the story. That's when Louis' life started coming off the tracks. Now, in all fairness, uh, the, the um, producer, Matt Baer, was trying to get the full story in. The problem is the movie was already two hours long. You know, they couldn't go any longer. No one's going to sit in for a three, four hour movie. It, it was such a successful movie. Universal come back and said, you know what? We'll do the second half of the story now. And you can do the whole, you know, 90 minute movie just on his conversion. And, you know, that whole story about his conversion. And so we got the best of both worlds. We got to spend two movies talking about man Louis Zamperini and what God did in his life. And so, um, and it took place at the 1949 Los Angeles Crusade. And uh, for those who do not know, this would be the most pivotal crusade in my granddaddy's life. Um, he called this a watershed moment. I mean, this was his defining moment in life was in the 1949 
Los Angeles crusade. And that's when Louis Zamprini would come to know Christ. He would give his life to Christ. He hated my granddaddy. He, didn't, he hated preachers. He hated God. He said, why should I thank God for being a drunk? Why should I thank God for letting me be tortured by the Japanese? Why, why should I thank God for taking my ability to run away? Because he had broken his leg and he just couldn't run like that anymore. He was one of the fastest humans of all time. And uh, he had a lot of the records, and they were just recently broken, not terribly long ago, but he held the records for so long. And uh, he never got to race in his prime. World War II broke out in his prime years. And his body, because of his being beaten and starvation, destroyed his body where he couldn't, he would never get 100% again. And um, he tried, and his leg broke, and his running career came to an end. And so he didn't like anything to do with God. He wanted to get away from God. His wife, Cynthia, had, she went by herself, gave her life to Christ. She was going to divorce Louis because Louis was a, a drunk, and he knew it. And then, uh, but when she came back and said, Louis, I'm not going to divorce you. I love you, and I'm going to, God doesn't want me to divorce you, and I'm gonna, we're going to get through this together. Well, that just all of a sudden, that softened his heart just a little, where she said, will you come with me? Fine, I'll come. And uh, he would go, and he heard my granddaddy. He hated everything he heard, walked out the back. Uh, so about the next week, she finally talked to him going one more time. And so he came forward. He, he heard the message. He hated everything he heard. He got up to walk out. But instead of his feet letting him go out, his feet went the other direction, made him walk forward. He's like, I don't know how I found myself at the front. He said, I'm sitting there and I'm bawling. And he realized that Christ said, he, Christ had gotten them through all that suffering in life um, to this one point. And uh, he fell in love with Christ that day. His sins were forgiven. His life was forever changed. And now I get to play the, in the movie that portrays this great change of life. And I got to play the role of my grandfather. That's pretty cool. I asked the producer, Matt, how many people get to actually play their relative in a movie? And uh, we could come down with two other people. So that was uh, pretty special. And I'm preaching the same message, the ex all my words in the movie, every word I say is from my granddaddy's 1949 Los Angeles Crusade sermons. So I think, we, I think we used about three or four of his sermons, just pieces of it. When we're filming this, and we're filming in it in Pomona, California, uh, right across from Cal Poly, and, uh, and I'm, when I'm preaching this sermon, I'm thinking to myself, the last time this sermon's probably ever been heard was in 1949. And I'm preaching it again here in California about, you know, I don't know, 30, 40 miles as a crow flies from where it actually was first heard. And that gave me chills. My granddaddy always wanted Louis' life to be in a major movie. So he would have been proud of his friend, Louis, being, you know, this great movie about Louis' life. And, and I think he'd been real appreciative of and he knew that I was in the movie. He didn't get to see the he didn't get to see the movie. He passed away during the editing process, just like Louis did. Louis died during the editing process of the first movie. And so neither one got to see the final product from 1949 until my granddaddy died. They were lifelong friends. Now Louis would die a few years beforehand, but they would spend their whole life as good friends, riding back and forth, never forgot one another, and always was appreciative to one another. They were always good friends. Recently, Will wrote his first book, a collection of devotions and stories called Redeemed. Through stories from his own life and other stories passed on from family and friends, Will can trace how God is working in people's lives. I'm a storyteller. I like telling stories. If you can't tell, I like to tell stories. Um, I guess I get that from my grandparents side of things. Both my grandparents, they love to tell stories. It's just a collection of stories. Most of them are my stories. Some are my granddad's stories. Um, but most of them are, when I say my stories, they, they're recollections I had, things I got to see. There's a couple of them that were just, these are stories I heard about my, from my granddad. Um, and so, but I want to share these things where I saw God work in a unique way. And I saw God do something supernatural. These aren't stories about Will Graham. They're not stories about Billy Graham. Grant, they, they're things that we've seen, so there's, there's, we're there in a sense. But we're seeing God act. We're seeing God change lives. We're seeing God speak to people. And so these are God's stories. And, and I believe if God's not the hero of your story, then your story's not worth telling. <laughs> All 
all right, in all honesty. The, the, your, God's got to be the hero of every story. And so I want to show God how God showed up in people's lives. God saved marriages. God uh, did supernatural things. I want to share that with people, but how that can apply to their life today. And it, what's interesting, I did this before my granddaddy passed away. We had already finished it, submitted it. Um, it was here at the publisher uh, when February 21st came, which is the day that my grandfather passed away from this earth and moved into heaven. And so during that time, I had to go back and rewrite some of my chapters because I had my granddaddy in present tense. And so I had to go back and that was a little bit sobering, you know, um, you know, miss my granddaddy. But when you know, when you have to go back and change things, you know, because he's not here anymore. You just finished it. You know, it's like, wow, oh, i got to make these changes. And it, I wasn't sad because I had to change my book. I was just, just the fact that you're putting your granddaddy from present tense to past tense. So that was a bit tough. But it was one of the, um, it was a great privilege to write the book. And I'm so grateful I have the chance to write the book. And I hope that God will give me a chance to write more books. And because uh, my granddaddy used every possible means to proclaim the good news of Christ. Uh, my grandfather, um, he was on radio. That was his first thing that he commuted. He would end up going by um, national radio, like ABC, NBC radio, which is an incredible story on its own. He would also start television. He would do satellite television. He would do uh, live television. Uh, he would do internet. He wrote books, lots of books. He wrote a lot of periodicals. There was a great story that that uh, my granddaddy went to China. And it was the first time he had ever gone to China because China has been closed for years to outsiders. Uh, this was in the 80s, late 80s. And uh, my grandmother was, my grandmother grew, grew up in China. She was born in China. She was raised in China. Her, her parents were medical missionaries. And so that's where China was home to her. And so China says, okay, we'll let Billy Graham come over and he can preach in a few churches, that's it. And so he came over to preach in a few churches, but to see where my grandmother was born, raised, her house was still there. But uh, they were sitting there and they were gonna take over, there was a canal there, so they were gonna take a little boat ride down the canal. And all these people were coming out and they're all waving and my granddaddy's waving back and he said, how do these people know who I am? It's not like I'm, they got Christian newspapers over here and uh, my grandmother just leans forward. <clears throat> Bill, they're not waving at you. They're waving at her. <laughs> it's my way, my grandmother kept him humble. You know, a lot of people know about Billy Graham Crusades. My father has Franklin Graham festivals. Will Graham has Will Graham celebrations. We're here to celebrate what God's doing in people's lives. And so we just use the word celebration. And that's what it is, to celebrate changing of life from that which was once dead now made alive that's something to worth celebrate and so that's where we kind of use the name there's nothing there's nothing much different i tell people the biggest different is the color of the hair of the preacher and uh mine's it, mine's turning gray quick but it's less gray than my dad's and it was a lot less gray than my granddad's when people come to uh, evangelistic meetings whether it's crusades festivals or celebrations and it doesn't matter what generation, they're all the same. They're exactly the same. There's no differences. Um, people are still looking for purpose. They're still looking for joy. They're still looking for meaning in life. Uh, they still have family problems. They have personal problems, whether it's addictions. There's nothing new under the sun, the Bible tells us. There's nothing new. All these things are the same. Looking for belonging, looking for um, relationship, looking for meaning, nothing's changed. Um, it comes in different forms today, and so that nothing's changed. And so th that's why the Bible message still transcends all cultures, all times. Uh, it doesn't matter. My granddaddy's preached it. I've preached it. My dad's preached it. So it's multiple generations we're talking about. Lot, my, listen, my generation's a lot different than my granddad's generation. When you just think of the world that we live in today. But the same basic needs still apply. Um, they just look different, but the needs are still there. You can find Will's book, Redeemed, Devotions for the Longing Soul, at your favorite book retailer today.
Stay tuned to hear our next guest, author and decorator Mike Willen Smith, after this brief message about a free offer from Jesus Calling. Are you looking for a way to keep track of your daily prayers along with Jesus Calling? The Jesus Calling Family Prayer Calendar goes right along with your daily readings from Jesus Calling. Each day begins with a guided reflection, followed by a space for you to fill in your prayers of thanksgiving and special requests. You can get your free Jesus Calling Family Prayer Calendar by visiting jesuscalling.com slash offers. Visit jesuscalling.com slash offers to download your free family prayer calendar today. Our next guest is author and decorator Mike Willen Smith. For the past 10 years, Mike Willen has been encouraging women to embrace their homes, imperfections and all, on her blog, The Nester. Today, Mike Willen tells us how she began to let go of perfectionism and be content with what she has, living fully right where God put her, and how she's been able to use her home to connect with others. My name is Mike Willen Smith. I go by The Nester online because when I first got online, I was afraid of the internet and thought, there's no way I can put a name like Mike Willen out there. But um, over time, I've learned that the, inter- the internet is a pretty amazing place. It's one of my favorite places to hang out. Um, I have a blog called Nesting Place where I encourage women in their home. I really believe if we can get our home looking the way we've always wanted, then we can use it the way we've always dreamed. So I'm a mom of three boys. Our oldest is 21. So he's in college. We've got a senior in high school and a junior in high school. And I've been married to my husband, Chad, for yeah 23 years, I think. And he is the kind of man with a dirty job with lots of dirty boots. We've got a dog and two cats. So Our house is uh, very lived in, loved on, and um, messy, but I try to keep it pretty within the mess. My mom always cared about our house. I always looked forward to coming home from school. I'm very much a homebody, so I think, you know, our personalities is part of it. Um, But home was always a safe place to be creative. We were allowed to make a mess and not clean it up if needed. Like, our home was always really tidy, but... um, I can always remember having a place in our house where if we built like an elaborate Barbie home or neighborhood, my mom wouldn't necessarily make us clean it up that night and pack it all away. And at the time that just seemed normal. But now with my own kids and looking back, I think, I think that really helps shape my creativity of just being able to play. And so my mom let us do that. And I'm so grateful for that. I don't know. I mean, I consider myself creative and I think that was part of it was just having that freedom in childhood to create, to make things. I would go in my mom and dad's room and like get little tiny potted plants out of their room and then use it in my Barbie house to be like a massive plant. Like I just remember doing stuff like that and never questioning if I could, but just having the freedom to have fun. My mom became a believer when I was really young. Um, I can't remember, maybe I was six or seven. Um, And she would go to church and take us and my sister and I became believers. And so our first big prayer was that it was for our dad, that he would become a Christian. And we saw that um, prayer answered eventually when I was in seventh grade. And so I think my um, view of God and how he interacted with our family was very trusting like that to see that answered was a big deal you know when my dad was ready then he was ready and so lots of great things happened after that like my dad has kind of always had like the kind of a teacher mindset and so my family is really open with like their decisions like okay this is how we're buying a car and this is the decision that we're making we've always had family talks like that growing up and so when my dad became a believer, I mean, same thing. He was really, really open with it. And this is why, and this is why now, and this is what I, how I think differently. And this is how God's using this. So this is what we're praying for. So that was my experience growing up. You know, when I was 13, my dad became a Christian and our home life in some ways changed a lot. And then other ways didn't really change. But, you know, looking back, I know that changed the trajectory of our entire family. As Mike Willen grew older and began to live in a house of her own, she found that creating the homey feeling she experienced as a child was much more difficult than she thought, especially after she moved with her husband and family more than a dozen times. 
Well, we've moved 14 times in Chad and I've been married again, I think 23 years. So it's a lot of houses and it, it, there are good things about it. Some of the things I loved was getting to be creative in a different space, um, not growing tired of a space. But I think for my personality, my secret wish was always just to settle down already and stay put and make roots and make friends and not have to move again. So in many ways, that was exhausting and not what I felt like I expected or wanted in my home life and my raising kids life and my married life. It was completely opposite of what I ever thought would happen. Playing Barbies in our back room at our house, I realized was not about the stories of the Barbies or the backstories or the drama. For me, it was always about setting up their home. And that was the part of play that I always loved. And so as an adult, that just carried over. And, you know, when I was a teenager, I was moving furniture around in my room, my parents would go on vacation or have something they needed to do out of town. And so it'd be my sister and I. And instead of like throwing a big raging party, I would move all their furniture around and surprise them when they got home. Just doing things to make home feel better has always been a part of what I do. So all of those moves, I couldn't see where that fit. Like it just felt wrong to me. I wanted to stay put, but I had to learn how to set up a home quickly in less than perfect circumstances. Sometimes we were renting, sometimes we were in an apartment, sometimes we were able to buy a house, but we didn't have maybe the money or the time or the resources to do exactly what I wanted. No one's circumstances are ever perfect when it comes to anything. And especially when it comes to home, there's always something lacking that we were, wish could be different. Um, and so instead of just waiting for the next house, it hit me that, you know, my kids are growing up and I want how I want our home to feel homey. So it's time to hang the pictures on the wall. Time to put some rugs down on the floor. Even if it's not my ideal dream house, perfect space, I can make it better. And this is our home. Like the time is now. And so I really learned through all of those moves, how to set up a home, how to make it homey quickly, uh, what worked, what didn't work, um, how to use different spaces. Like it was the best education in home I could have ever had. Where I really learned to embrace imperfection was living in a bunch of imperfect homes. And the next house was imperfect. And the next house was imperfect. And not even having the control to maybe paint a wall. So if you're living in a rental house, a lot of times you sign a contract saying you won't paint the walls. And so I had to come to terms with there's going to be a lot of things I can't do. So how can I still be okay with that? Like I could just wait and, and wish on the next place. But life is happening so what can I do to embrace where I am and be inspired where I am? When we think about um, what Joanna Gaines is doing and all of those photos we may see on TV or Instagram or um, Pinterest, she is giving us inspiration. She is giving us the gift of inspiration. It's what we do with that gift that shows um, maybe how we feel about it and those big emotions that can be linked with that. Because if we look at a beautiful photo and we feel like we have to copy it, that's where all of those sad, shameful, guilty feelings of I'm never going to have that go in. When we think, oh, you know, there's that beautiful dining room. It's got a table I can't afford. It's got a high ceiling that I don't have. But when we look at a photo um, as a person who wants to be inspired, which means what can I take away from this and apply to my own home? And that is work. Like that is not the lazy girl's, uh, lazy person's way out. That is uh, taking an active stance and saying, how can I apply this to my life? Okay, so I love this room. What is it about this room that I love? And it might be that you love that it's open and airy and has natural light. Maybe you need to take the blinds down in your living room. There's little steps like that. If we're willing to put in the work and pay attention and not just focus on what we don't have. And I'm only saying this because I've learned it the hard way of feeling so ill content in my own house, in my own situation and not wanting to be like that anymore. The first book I wrote was about finding contentment in your home. And I really felt like that was all I ever had to say about house. Like, because I don't care how you decorate. Like, I just, I just want you to love your home. Who cares what kind of sofa you have? But as I was continuing to hang out in the online community, I realized, oh, there's so many of us who are ready to buy a sofa and we don't know what to do or really want to host the community group, but we don't feel right about our home. And when that happens, it's such a roadblock for us that it's hard to move forward. And 
you know, we're using real money and real time and making real decisions about what to put in our home. It doesn't necessarily cost anymore to make something pretty, but you have to know how to make these decisions. And that's when I decided to write this book all within the scope of cozy minimalism, which means getting the most amount of style with the least amount of stuff. So we want that balance of having plenty and coziness in our home and abundance, but also that minimal, that simplicity, that peacefulness, that knowing when to say enough. And it's it's not one extreme or another. When you have too much coziness, it becomes clutter. And when you're too minimal, it becomes cold. But there's somewhere in between that we all fall that is a perfect balance for us in our perfect, you know, whatever time of life we're in, whatever our family situation is, whatever our house situation is. You know, I know different times in my life, I've had a higher need for abundance or a higher need for simplicity. And so cozy minimalism can kind of help you right where you are, make decisions in your home, real decorating decisions. Where do I put the sofa? How do I hang these drapes? What size rug do I get? And it sounds, you know, for a long time I was like, oh, who cares? It's just dumb design. But now I'm like, oh, it's so powerful because when we get our home looking the way we want it to look, we can finally use it and not have to think about it anymore. We can just volunteer it, have people over and, you know, use it the way we've always wanted to use it and be proud of that and not have to be preoccupied with it. I think it's best to start always, always, always one room at a time. So you never want to be working in more than one room. Now, which room, it just kind of depends on where you are. If there is one room in your life that brings you particular stress or one room that would bring you great joy if it's done, or maybe there's a room that is like almost done. And so that would be an easy win. So it, I think it depends on maybe what your goal is of where to start. But I think all of us kind of know in our heart, like I really need to start with such and such room. That might be your family room or your bedroom or just the simplest room in your house that you know, if you really spent a day thinking about it and working through it, you would have that finished and you could forget about it. I hope that women will be more confident in making decisions in their home. I know for me, I, I certainly don't consider myself one, like a decluttering expert or two, a full-fledged minimalist, but I've always been really careful in my schedule and in my life, of like what I say yes and what I say no to, but for some reason that never carried over to my home. I always, always, always held onto things. And my reason was just in case, like I better hold on to anything like a lamp, a chair. Um, I look back and I, I think it was a trust issue of, I have this now. And I think part of it was like, Oh, I'm so responsible. I will keep this thing forever just in case. But also I think part of it was like not trusting that God would provide it later. Like I better hold on to this because who knows what's going to happen in the future. And I think that was a big trust issue for me. I have a chair in the corner of our family room and it's positioned great because you can't see the TV from that chair, even if it's on. And I, we call it the introvert chair. So this, this extreme lean back, when you sit back in it, like the world is kind of muffled. It's really nice. So even when everyone's home, which, you know, especially in the summer, my whole family's here, like we're all together. I feel like I can sit back in that chair and kind of enter a little bit quieter world. So I've got a basket right next to my chair. It's got you know, my journal day planner type of things. It's got some cookbooks and it's got our Jesus calling copy where the binding is all broken. <laughs> and it always flips over to the same page because it's been broken up so many times. Um, and so that's a lot of times, unless just the weather is magnificent, where I will sit and read a little bit. Whether or not I'm praying in that chair depends on what the family's doing. But I think it's important to like set up places for specific things in our life. There's something about having that routine and having that place to go. And it can be super simple, like just having a chair, having a lamp so that you can see, having a basket. So maybe if your stack of books are going to bother you, like for me to be able to throw everything in a basket and not have to look at it, but maybe it's cluttered in the basket, but not out in real life. All of those things help me to be able to have that practice and be able to sit in my chair every morning and have a time of quiet and reading and thinking and, you know, just getting in touch with God and being encouraged and really setting my whole day. I'll tell you one thing I like about Jesus Calling is because it's simple and it's short and I don't have to figure out what to do because sometimes just having 
a time of quiet in my day and getting over that hurdle of like, yes, I'm going to do that. If I have to figure out what it is I'm going to read or what uh, journey through the Bible I'm going to keep up with, like that's enough roadblock for me to be like, oh, put it off. I'll do it later. But if I know I can just open up my Jesus calling and read that day and get it done in like two or three minutes, the hurdles are gone and I'm more apt to do it. That's one of the things that has really been helpful for me. So Jesus Calling on August 4th, hold my hand and walk joyously with me through this day. Together, we will savor the pleasures and endure the difficulties it brings. Be on the lookout for everything I have prepared for you. Stunning scenery, bracing winds of adventure, cozy nooks for resting when you are weary and much more. I am your guide as well as your constant companion. I know every step of the journey ahead of you all the way to heaven. You don't have to choose between staying close to me and staying on the course. Since I am the way, staying close to me is staying on the course. As you focus your thoughts of me, I will guide you carefully along today's journey. Don't worry about what is around the next bend. Just concentrate on enjoying my presence and staying in step with me beautiful. To learn more about Mike Willen and her new book, Cozy Minimalist Home, please visit thenester.com. Next time on the Jesus Calling Podcast, we visit with Christian artist and songwriter David Crowder. After years of massive success with the David Crowder Band, David shares why the band made a decision to part ways during one of their most prolific seasons. If you didn't have the economy of faith, it makes no sense because in the economy that we were breathing in and out every day, we were right where you sh- you've worked really hard to be. Um, but what our values were, were um, I care, I would, I would rather my wife uh, be next to me <laughs> and thrilled and happy and full of life than, um, you know, have a, have a number one record. Do you love hearing great stories of faith each week via the Jesus Calling podcast? We want to hear from you. If you haven't already subscribed to the Jesus Calling podcast, visit the Jesus Calling page at iTunes.com and hit the subscribe button. While you're there, we'd love for you to leave us a review and tell us how you feel about the show and what future guests you'd love to see. Your reviews and subscription help us share these stories of faith to more people who need the hope and encouragement of Jesus Calling. If you have your own story to share, we'd love to hear from you. Visit JesusCalling.com to share your story today.